Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heidzik. We're so glad you joined us today. As people of God, we are part of a spiritual kingdom even as we live in the world. Jesus will ultimately establish his kingdom on earth, but until then, we are called to be his ambassadors here and now. In this series, Pastor Skip explores what it means to occupy till he comes. Uh, it's that time of the year. Uh, this is Operation Christmas Child Shoebox. We've been doing this for decades. I think we got in on it the second year uh, that they started. It is, in my opinion, the most effective child evangelism tool in the world. 200 million of these have been given out since it started. 200 million boxes. These are kids who, in many cases, would never get a present. They get so excited. I've been around the world watching them open these presents. They get so excited, and they discover that God loves them. They ask who gave the gift. They, why did they give the gift? Um, inside, you, you pack. It's pretty easy. You get a shoebox. And a couple ways to get a shoebox, by the way. Oh, we can give you one. We have them out there in the foyer on your way out. Grab one. They're free. Fill it with toys or... You may want to buy yourself a pair of shoes and use a shoebox. You see, there's a lot of ways to, to work this angle. Uh, honey, I need a new pair of shoes so we can do Operation Christmas Child. See, there's just a lot of possibilities here. So you put toys in it. Um, there's a fake slinky. Uh, I have words to say about these, but it has nothing to do with what we're doing. Um, school supplies, um, some hygiene items, pack it in a shoebox. And uh, it goes uh, to kids in 100 different countries, over 100 different countries. So uh, we uh, want to push that. It's a, it's a good way to get involved. Um, Operation Christmas Child, get your shoebox on the way out. Second, uh, Wednesday night, as you heard, we covered this whole topic going on. This week, we will continue with a specific topic that has been going on this week, and that is the shocking rise in anti-Semitism and uh, the speech in, in many of the protests in New York, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, massive groups around the world, and the language that is being used is very Nazi-like uh, in, in, um, in the wording. So why is that? Why is there a rise in anti-Semitism right now? We're going to be looking at that topic uh, from a biblical perspective. Uh, also, I'm going to interview um, on Wednesday a friend of mine who is, among other things, sits on the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. This week, he gave a speech to the European Parliament a very impassioned speech. I'm going to be talking a little bit about that in lieu of the, the present war in the Middle East. But for this morning, would you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. You and I as believers have dual citizenship. We are citizens of earth, but we are also citizens of heaven. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, wrote Paul the Apostle. What that means is we have two addresses. We have an earthly address. You get your mail. You get the envelopes. Uh, people write cards to you. Companies send bills to you. There's junk mail. At that address, on the envelopes, your name is written and your earthly address is written. But your name is also written in the Lamb's Book of Life because your future address physically will be in another place that we know as heaven. Having dual citizenship, however, is tricky. The tricky part is how do you live responsibly in both places so that you don't overemphasize one address over the other? That's always a balancing act for the believer. Some become so involved in this world, in this address, with social causes and activism and all sorts of ways that are good, but they neglect the heavenly part. 
Others get so theologically, heavenly gazed and preoccupied, they forget about responsibility here. Sometimes Christians are accused of being so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. But I found people who are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. So how do we strike that balance? That's what I want to talk to you about. That's the issue that the disciples are facing in Acts chapter 1. They are expecting a coming kingdom, a messianic kingdom, what we now know from our last series as the millennial kingdom. But they have a kingdom task to do right here, right now, until that kingdom comes. So they're facing the struggle of dual citizenship. They're putting all their eggs in that future kingdom basket, that eschatological, literal kingdom that is coming, but they're neglecting their earthly address. And it's for one simple reason. The disciples are distracted. You might say they have a case of spiritual ADD. They get distracted Uh, easily in one direction, and you will see how Jesus brings them back on point. I came across this little illustration this week. A man bought a new hunting dog. He was eager to see how the dog would perform, so he took him out to track a bear. No sooner had they gotten into the woods than the dog picked up the trail. Suddenly, he stopped, sniffed the ground, and headed in a new direction. He had caught the scent of a deer that crossed the bear's path. A few moments later, he stopped again, this time smelling a raccoon that crossed the path of the deer. Then a turkey, a rabbit, and so on. Till finally, the breathless hunter caught up with his dog, only to find him barking triumphantly down the hole of a field mouse. That's our dilemma. Sometimes we find ourselves barking down the wrong hole. We bark down the hole of activism. We bark down the hole of intellectualism. We bark down the hole of sensationalism. We bark down the hole of biblical futurism when all the while we should be doing evangelism. Now, what I want to do today in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look principally at verses 4 through 8, this is a message called, How to Live Until His Kingdom Comes. The series is Kingdom City. The message is how to live until His kingdom comes. And there's three experiences while we wait. There's something we can do, something we should do, and something we must do. We begin with the first. We can become preoccupied. Look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them. This is Jesus and his disciples. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Stop there. What the disciples asked sounds like an interruption. Jesus tells them about a task. He's leading up to that task. He's talking about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And they pose a question to him that sounds like he, an interruption of what he's saying. We would call it a non sequitur, a statement that really doesn't connect to the previous statement that was made. So he's telling them about the Holy Spirit, and they say, hey, let's set the date for your coming kingdom. Now, you should also know that the disciples were really good at this. They were really good at being distracted. 
Um, you remember the time when our Lord was transfigured before them. They were up in the northern part of Israel, and Moses and Elijah were also transfigured along with Jesus before the disciples. Instead of just drinking in the moment, Peter launches into a real estate plan. Hey, let's build three condominiums, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I mean, it was so bad, the father had to interrupt Peter's interruption and say, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Another time when they were on their way to Jerusalem for the final leading up to the cross, our Lord informs his disciples of what is coming down in Jerusalem. I'm gonna be arrested, boys. I'm gonna be beaten up, and I'm gonna be killed on a cross. All they can think about is Am I going to sit on your right hand or left hand in the kingdom? And so they started arguing among themselves about who would be the greatest. And one of their moms comes to Jesus and says, I have a request for my two boys. Can one sit on your right hand and the other on your left hand in the kingdom? So they're really good at being distracted and getting off point. Here... They are preoccupied with a kingdom. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they're preoccupied with that heavenly future eschatological kingdom. Now, I want to be fair with the disciples. I don't want to like pile up and beat up on them because it's on one sense understandable that they would ask about the kingdom because go back to verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the what? Kingdom of God. So Jesus brought up the subject of the kingdom. He spoke often about his kingdom. And when he spent his final 40 days after the resurrection with them, he's speaking about the kingdom. So he places that on their minds. But what Jesus wants to do is shift their focus from being preoccupied with the future to being occupied in the present. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, he said, occupy until I come. Now let me me take you back uh, in your minds to our last message we gave on this series called Thy Kingdom Come. In that message I told you there's two aspects to the kingdom. There's an internal aspect, there's an external aspect. Uh, An inward kingdom, an outward kingdom. The kingdom of God where God reigns over your heart But then there's the coming real kingdom where he rules over the world. So there's two different aspects of the kingdom. And though Jesus in these 40 days may have been talking eschatology with them, I think primarily, given the context of what I read in chapter 1, I think he's speaking primarily of his dominion over the hearts of men. He is thinking of evangelism. He wants to save people. He wants to move into their lives and be their king. That's what he is thinking of. But they are preoccupied. They are thinking of that future eschatological, literal kingdom of Jesus on the earth, what we now call the millennial kingdom. Okay, like the disciples, we also can become preoccupied. Very easy to do so. Uh, We live in a world of distractions. Anybody agree with that? Do we get distracted quite easily in life? There are so many ways we get distracted. It seems harder and harder when you're with somebody to actually be with someone. Uh, Just a minute, I got a text here. I got to get this, right? I mean, we get so distracted. And and if you don't think that's a reality, just uh, just go look at the usage report on your own device. And, And wow, I've been on it that many hours this week can be pretty staggering. So we get distracted quite easily. We can also become theologically distracted, where our focus is always on the future all the time. Our complete attention 
is spent on how things fit into Bible prophecy. There's nothing wrong with that per se, by the way. I just did a whole 25 weeks on that. We looked at the end times in depth. But that can be imbalanced where the first question we ask is, well, how does that fit into Bible prophecy? I mean, that's one of our first questions, right? When this war hit this last week with Gaza and Israel is, is this the end? And I've been asked that question a lot in my ministry. And I get it. I understand it. The Bible does speak about the future. But we can become imbalanced. Back in the Gulf War in 1990, people said, is this the end? Y2K, the year 2000, is this the end? September 11th, 2001, is this the end? The Iraq War, 2003, is this the end? And now this week, is this the end? And my answer is pretty basic when somebody says, is this the end? I, I say, what if it is? What if it is the end? If it's the end, I'm not called to do anything different than I'm doing right now. Nothing changes. The end is coming sometime. Might as well be now. If it's coming, I'm not changing my course in any way. But imbalance comes when we let the future distract us from the present. I remember in the Jesus movement, we talked about the Lord's coming back a lot. And we expected that Jesus would come back like, you know, 1980s, you know, he's coming. And it got so talked about that some of my contemporaries became a little irresponsible. And this is how I know that. I announced to some of my friends that I was going to college, and they said, going to college? Why on earth would you go to college? Jesus will come back soon. Before you graduate from college, Jesus is going to show up. Why would you waste your time and go to college? I said, okay, if Jesus comes back, he'll find me a college. (laughs) Because last time I checked, colleges need Jesus too. In fact, I would say these days, it's the one place they really need Jesus. So we can become preoccupied. Let's move to the second experience, what we should do. We can become preoccupied. We should become productive. We should become productive. So they're asking about the kingdom, and are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And verse 7, he said to them, look at his answer. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You'll notice that their interruption is followed by Jesus' correction. They interrupt him, he corrects them. They get off point, he brings them back on point. He says, basically, don't worry about the kingdom that is coming, think more about the kingdom you should be spreading. You're thinking of people going to the kingdom, you should be bringing the kingdom to the people. You're worried about nationalism and futurism I'm thinking evangelism. You're worried and concerned about when it's coming. I want you to think about what you should be doing until it comes. The Bible does predict the future. In depth, actually. There's incredible detail about the future, as we have noted for 25 weeks in our previous series. And though it gives us a lot of detail, there's a lot of detail it doesn't give us. And so we wonder, is this it? Is this the time? And though the Bible does speak about the future kingdom and about the coming of Jesus Christ, it doesn't give us that information so we can sit on a hill, strum a guitar, and eat bird seed. We have a task at hand. 
Jesus gave a parable in Luke 19. I alluded to it a moment ago, Luke 19. He gave a parable, and the reason he gave the parable, it says, because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. They're preoccupied with the kingdom. So Jesus launches into a parable about a nobleman going into a far country, and he calls his servants and says to them, Occupy until I come. Do business until I come. Be about my business until I come. So instead of being concerned about the when, we should be concerned about the what do we do until the when happens. So what is it? What are we to do? How are we to be productive? Verse 8 has the answer. Right in the middle of the verse, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. What does that mean to be a witness? Well, a witness, martyres, that's the Greek term, martyres. We get our word martyr from that word, by the way. And we think that a, uh, we think of a martyr as somebody who dies for their faith. But the idea of a martyres, a martyr, a witness, is somebody who sees something and someone who says something. That's a martyr. That's a witness. The reason it has been associated with martyrdom is because people who saw something and said something back in the second, third, and fourth centuries were getting killed for it. But the idea of a witness is somebody who sees something and then says something. That's a witness. So if you go to court as a witness, you'll be put on the stand and asked to testify. What did you see? What did you hear? And you will tell what you saw and heard. You are being a witness. And so it is throughout the book of Acts. Peter, Philip, Paul, they were all witnesses. They saw something. They said something. Acts chapter 2, Peter is at Pentecost. He gives a bold, clear, impassioned presentation, a witness for Jesus Christ. He has seen the risen Christ, and now he says something to the people. In Acts chapter 8, Philip was a witness to the Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot, which, by the way, he was in Gaza when he went and gave him that witness. Very interesting. In chapter 14, Paul is at Lystra. He has seen the power of the Lord working in his own life, and he begins to say to the people what he has seen. He says, we preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made heaven and earth. Later on, he's in Athens. He stands on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, speaks to all the philosophers and the people. And Paul says, you know, I'm going through your town, and I see that you have a statue to the unknown God. The God that you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. What he saw, he said. He was a witness. So we are to be witnesses, because that's what the early church did with the gospel message. They were witnesses. I have a question for you. What if, what if you were sent a message, but you never received the message? Or let me put it another way. What if somebody sent to you the most important message of your life, but that message was never delivered? You know, that actually happened. Back in 1949, a man named John Courier was Convicted of murder. He claimed he didn't do it, but he was convicted of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. Later on, he was paroled to a work farm somewhere down in the south. In 1968, so 19 years later, his sentence was terminated. They got more information on the case. They terminated his sentence. He was a free man. And so a letter was sent to where he was being incarcerated, that he was a free man. He never got the letter. He never got the letter. He never saw the letter. He kept working for another 10 years. 
Even though the letter had been sent, it was never delivered. He never read it. He worked for another 10 years. So 29 years of John Currier's life were wasted years. Finally, a state parole officer found the letter, got it to him, and he was a free man. What if the most important message the world has ever been given never got delivered? So we can become preoccupied, but we should become productive. And we're productive by being witnesses, by delivering the mail that has been sent. Now, uh, dig a little bit deeper with me. Uh, Notice in verse 8 that uh, Jesus gives a three-point strategic plan for the Great Commission. You know the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's the Great Commission. Now he gives a three-point strategic plan. He goes from locally to globally. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now here's what I want you to know about that. That happened literally. That happens to be the outline of the book of Acts. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, end of the earth. Chapter 1 through 7, the gospel goes to Jerusalem. Chapter 8 and 9, the gospel goes to Judea and Samaria. Chapter 10 through the rest of the book, it goes throughout Asia Minor, all throughout the known world at that time. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. So it happened literally. But something else, it happens sequentially or subsequently. In other words, what happened then happens to be a pattern for today. The best example I can think of is that's how our church was birthed and developed. I left my Jerusalem. My Jerusalem at the time was Southern California, Jerusalem and Judea. I left Jerusalem and came to my Samaria, New Mexico. But now New Mexico is my Jerusalem and your Jerusalem. And from here... The gospel goes out to our Judea, our Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So it happened literally. It happened subsequently, but it should also happen personally. That is, in in each of our lives, ever-widening circles of influence are touched. So you get saved, you tell your family. That's the smallest circle. That's the most intimate circle. Like Jesus said to the young man who uh, wanted to follow Jesus everywhere, Jesus said, go back home and tell your family the great things that I have done. So we begin with our family, then our friends, then extended relatives, then people at work, and uh, then different people groups within the city. And the kingdom is spread throughout our city. So we can become preoccupied. We should become productive. You know, listen, people get distracted and church people get distracted. D.L. Moody once said, the church reminded him of firemen straightening pictures on the wall of a burning house. Hey, the building is burning. Yeah, but the picture isn't quite right. Stop. Right? There's bigger fish to fry. Don't worry about the minutia. So we can become preoccupied, we should become productive, and then finally, the must. We must become prepared. We must become prepared. Now, we will look at the power to be productive. Verse 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Anybody know what that is? It's the Holy Spirit. He kept promising that in the Gospels. The promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized, here it is, with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. The disciples had been commissioned by Jesus. 
In Matthew 28, he said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. You know the script. The disciples, having seen the risen Christ, are fired up. They're full of zeal. It's like, okay, let me loose. Turn me loose. I'm going to go get them. Because I have just seen somebody dead alive again. That's enough for me. I've been with you three years. You died. You rose again. I am ready to go. Jesus says, go, but don't go quite yet. Wait. You have to wait for something. Before you just go in your own strength, you need to wait for the power to go. The power source. Because otherwise, you're going to go out on your own. You'll fall flat on your face. You cannot do this task alone. So... You will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't go yet. You need the right equipment for the job. Now, I mentioned that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit several times. He said, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit. If I go away, I'll send the Holy Spirit, who is the helper. He will direct you into all truth. He'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So that's the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and in particular, the empowering with the Holy Spirit. So get this. The book of Acts, we call it the book of the Acts of the what? The apostles. That's what it says at the top of your Bible. It doesn't say that in the text of Scripture itself. I think it's mistitled. It's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the disciples. Because 50 times in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. 50 times. And he is given the credit as one who convicts, one who saves, one who identifies missionaries, the one who sends missionaries, the one who directs the affairs of his church. And listen, you will never be able to understand the apostles unless you understand this. Because here's the question, what is it that turned a small group of timid, discouraged, weak men hiding in a room with locked doors into bold, courageous witnesses for Christ? What changed for them? Two things. Number one, the resurrection. They saw the resurrected Christ. Number two, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, just think for a moment. The impossibility of the undertaking of taking 12, actually 11, because one defected. So you got 11, one's going to have to be added to that. You take 12 guys, seven of them we know are fishermen. They're not college educated. They don't have business backgrounds. They're not entrepreneurial. They don't get along with each other. They get easily distracted. They have a hard time obeying him, and he lays world evangelism on them. Boys, go into all the world and change it. Preach the gospel to every creature. Really? Them? You're giving that task to them? That sounds impossible, not just by virtue of the enormity of the task, worldwide evangelism, but by the people you chose. And yet, and yet, the book of Acts records the story of how within 30 years, the gospel spread virtually throughout the Roman Empire, and the world was changed. What accounts for that? This. This, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's three key elements as we bring this to a close. Three key elements to understand this experience. First is the word power. You shall receive power. The word power is the word dunamin. We get our word dynamite from that. We also get our word dynamic from that, and I prefer thinking of it as a dynamic, not dynamite. There's too many people going to pieces already. This is a dynamic, a new capacity. 
The Amplified Bible renders it, you shall receive power, that is ability, efficiency, and might. You're going to receive a new capacity, a new ability, a new might, a new efficiency. Power. Second, look at the word upon. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit, that's the person, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay, stop there. That little word upon is a preposition. I'm going to take you back to your English class days in high school. You know what a preposition is, right? Preposition expresses the function of nouns and pronouns. So the preposition in Greek is is epi. See, I put a little Greek word up there just so I can impress you. Does that impress you? If so, go, wow. There you go. Yeah, thank you. It makes me look smart. So epi is the word upon. But there's two other prepositions that show us the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the believer. Um, Jesus said in the Gospel of John concerning the Holy Spirit, he dwells with you, that's the Greek word para, with you or beside you. But then he said, and he will be in you. That's the word "n." So we have three prepositions. The Holy Spirit is with you, para. That's the middle word. He will then be in you. And now Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come upon you. These are three different experiences. So before you're saved, as an unbeliever, the Holy Spirit comes by you. He comes with you. He's with you to convict you and convince you that you need Christ. That's his job. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Holy Spirit is first with you to convince you that you need Christ. And when you go, I get it. I need Christ. Jesus, come into my heart. Now the Holy Spirit comes in you. He comes in you. He's dwelling in you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He was with you, now he's in you. But Jesus said this, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Epi, different preposition. So here's the illustration. You're probably wondering, why does he have water up on stage? So here's a pitcher of water, here's a glass. If I put the glass next to the water, the water's relationship with the glass is it's with it. It's with it. That's it. But if I pour water into the glass, now the water is in it. But if I keep pouring, now it's overflowing. It's upon it. This is epi. In or with, in, upon. Now that's what Jesus said in John chapter 7. Remember he said this. He said, on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up in the temple and, and, and cried out and said, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow torrents or rivers of living water. Torrents of living water. Then John explains what Jesus just said. John writes this, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which was not yet given, for Jesus was not yet glorified. He'll be with you, convincing you you need Christ. You say, I need Christ. Jesus, come in. Now he's in you. But then he comes upon you. And he comes upon you to empower you for service, empower you to be a witness. And that's, that's the next word, witness. Witness. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the third element is that word witness. And here's what I want you to see. The purpose. The purpose for the power is proclamation. Don't miss this. The purpose for the empowerment, the filling, the coming upon of the Holy Spirit is to empower you for proclamation, to be a witness. The Holy Spirit comes upon believers not 
primarily so they can speak in tongues and prophesy and shake and jitter and say, hallelujah. <laughs> that happens fine, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is for being a witness, proclamation. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. When I was a kid, my dad had this cool little steam engine. It was chrome or aluminum and had, a little, it had big red wheels and a, a long cord, and you'd plug it in, and you'd fill it with water, and it'd heat up, and uh, it would actually move. It would actually move down the little, or on the table, until it reached the end of the cord. Then you got to bring it back and let it do it again. It also had a whistle. And you pull a little uh, chain, and the whistle opens up, and you hear a little toot, toot, and the steam did that. So the steam did two things. It empowered the locomotive, and it made a sound. Too many people are all about toot, 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 making all the noise, but not being empowered for service. So if you let all the steam go out of the whistle, you got nothing left for the service. And so the purpose of the power is the proclamation of the gospel. Now, we'll bring this to a close. Yes, thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Verse 9. I want you to notice something, and here's what I want you to notice right before we read it. These are the last words spoken by Jesus on earth. This is his final statement. What, what you just read is his final statement. How do I know that? Verse 9, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the final message of Christ to his followers was this, don't be distracted, stay at the task, hand to the plow, don't do it on your own, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. A news article in the Associated Press from Glasgow, Kentucky said this, Leslie Puckett after struggling to start his car, lifted the hood and discovered that someone had stolen the motor. <laughs> Pretty frustrating. Car won't start, car won't start. How come? Oh, there's no motor. Don't try to run your life without power. Don't try to live the Christian life without power. Allow the Holy Spirit to come upon you for service, for proclamation. As we close, I want to put up a saying in a moment. This is found inside the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. When they were renovating the Washington Monument, they found graffiti in the, the lobby underneath the marble wainscoting. Um, it's from the 1800s, but it can be seen today, and it says this. Whoever is the human instrument... Under God, in the conversion of one soul, erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduring than this. We go to Washington and look at that monument and go, ooh. And what this guy is saying is, you are the monument. And the monument you erect is better than that monument that you look at and go, ooh, ah, at. The monument that lasts eternity is the monument of, my life has been an instrument to lead one or two or more to the kingdom of God. I brought the kingdom to my city. I brought kingdom rule to the lives of people. So, we must never let the most important message ever sent fail to be delivered. We deliver the goods, we deliver the message. We open the letter, we read the letter, we tell people the truth, and that is evangelism. How to live until his kingdom come? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Stay at the task. Hand to the plow. Don't do it on your own. Father, we pray as we close, specifically 
as the Holy Spirit was with us, convinced us that we need Christ. Most of us here in this room have said yes to Jesus Christ. We've allowed him to come in. Our lives have been changed. We've seen it. Now you're telling us what you've seen. Now say it. Now be my witnesses. And we pray for that to happen, that your Holy Spirit would come upon us. That we would be being filled with the Holy Spirit in the present tense. For we ask it in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heidzig. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.